My castaway this week is a composer and lyricist. He learned his craft from a master, Oscar Hammerstein, and showed how good a pupil he'd been with his first professional success, the lyrics for West Side Story. Soon he was adding music to his words and in a series of often controversial works established himself as the modern heir to a great tradition. A funny thing happened on the way to the Forum, Company, Follies, A Little Night Music and Sweeney Todd showed how a serious artist could triumph in a frothy world, even if deep appreciation rather than popular acclaim is the ultimate reward. Their author has appeared to be content with this. I'm essentially a cult figure, he once said. My kind of work is caviar to the general. He is Stephen Sondheim. Sophisticated stuff for sophisticated people, Stephen. Are, are you content that, uh, that, that that's how your appeal goes? Content is an odd word. I, um, I'm not discontent, I, I suppose. I think the major joy of writing songs is that as many people as possible should hear them and therefore I'm content in that more and more people hear the songs as the years go by and see the shows. But what is important to you to, to get from the audience uh, in order of merit as it were? Mm. Do you like their respect before you want their kind of warm enjoyment. No, no, it's enjoyment. It's a, it's about, it's enjoyment. It's, it's watching an audience have a good time. But uh, as I understand it, you don't particularly care if they don't go away humming your tunes. Oh, but you know that whole thing about hummability is, it's vastly exaggerated. First of all, when an audience leaves a theatre humming a tune, it's because they were humming it when they came in. They had heard it before. It's a cliche. Yeah. Or, or a tune that has been exposed. Uh, I think uh, sometimes also, in, in, particularly in the old days, tunes are reprised many times during the course of the evening so that... They uh, can't avoid uh, humming it. Exactly right. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I remember at the, at the end of the first act of uh, A Little Night Music, there's a song called Weekend in the Country, which has uh, six or seven choruses. And sure enough, the audience, you know, supposedly I write unhummable music. They were all humming it at the interval because it had just been drummed into them. You mentioned a little night music. And, of course, famously there is <clears throat> the one everybody knows, your unvarnished oh, hit yes, single, yes, right. Send in the Clowns. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that, although it was very much part of, of, of the action, it also stood alone. Is that why it was a hit? Is that no, what made at, it at, a no, Send in the Clowns was not a hit for two years. Nobody, nobody sang it for two years while the show was running and then it was picked up by Judy Collins and then picked up by Frank Sinatra and then it was a hit but for two years the only person who sang it was Bobby Short a, a cabaret entertainer this is a song about a couple of adult people who have spent oh quite a long time together till one day one of them gets restless and decides to leave isn't it rich are we a pair? Me here at last on the ground, you in midair. Where are the clowns? Isn't it bliss? Don't you? Approve. One who keeps tearing around, one who can't move. But where are the clowns? There ought to be clowns. Just when I stop. Opening doors, finally finding the one that I wanted was yours. Making my entrance again with my usual flair. So sure of my lines, and no one is there. Don't you love a farce 
my fault, I fear. I thought that you'd want what I want. I'm sorry, my dear. But where are the clowns? Send in the clowns. Don't bother. Isn't it queer Losing my timing this late In my career But where are the clowns There ought to be clowns Well, maybe next year great song Thank lost you. love what well, might have been <laughs> not planning to take any of that kind of stuff to your desert island as i look down your list tell me about the first one you're going to take well the first one i would i would like to have is um, porgy and bess because i think it's the the finest american musical i always find porgy moving and i always I find it surprising and inventive, and I'm always jealous uh, of it. I've always wished that I'd written it. Willard White as Porgy, Barbara Conrad as Maria, and Florence Quivar as Serena singing Oh Bess, So Where's My Bess from Gershwin's Porgy and Bess with the Cleveland Orchestra, conducted by Lauren Marzell. Of course, Porgy and Bess is now classed as an opera. It's very much in the opera repertoire. What you do is called musical theatre. Some of your pieces, like Sweeney Todd, have been called operetta. Do you care about these no, distinctions? No, I, no, I, those, those are for critics and, and scholars. No, I, no. I, yeah, but you specifically chose musical theatre. You specifically chose Broadway, didn't you? Not the well. Opera. I was yes. But Oscar Hammerstein was my mentor, and he came from Broadway, and I, well, I was, I wanted to be what he was. So that, sure, I, I, I suspect if he had been an opera composer, I might have become an opera composer. I've often said that if he were a geologist, I would have been a geologist. So, you know, that's probably not <laughs> true, but... But but, it's, but, but people it's, say that, that you wanted to bring the opera to Broadway, that that is... is that, is that whoever true? said that... Not is, true? Is foolish. No, I've not, it wouldn't occur to me. No, no, but it's interesting where you placed yourself. And, and again, people say, you know, that you, you chose Broadway, but you willfully ignored the old Broadway wisdom, no girls, no gags, no chance. Well, that's what Oscar did with the opening of Oklahoma. Because we, we should remind people that he did revolutionise the music. Yes, and, 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 he did it, and he did it with this particular... He First he did it with Showboat. Oh, Joe, did you see that young man I was talking to? Yep, I've seen him, Miss Nolan. 
seen a lot like him on the river. I've never met such a gentleman. I can't wait to tell Julie all about him. When he asks the old river what he thinks, he knows all about them, boys. He knows all about everything. There's an old man called the Mississippi. That's the old man that I'd like to be. Right to see there if the world's not trouble. Right to see there if the land ain't free. Old Man River, yeah, Old Man River, he no something, but don't say nothing. He just keeps rolling. He keeps on rolling along. He knows that sinners, he knows that nothing, and it Oklahoma, which was an attempt to develop a story and character through song in, instead of around song. So when the curtain goes up, you don't have the dancing girls, no, which you no, had it, that, all it, the, it's a fa- it's fa- Oklahoma's famous because the opening did not involve the chorus. You that, got this man singing yeah, and, off and off singing stage. off stage. Yes. And then yes. coming on. And uh, I, I think that's been vastly exaggerated because that's not what was revolutionary about it. What is revolutionary about it is Oscar was using music to establish tone rather than merely to entertain. That is to say, the moment called for just that kind of song, so they did it. Instead of what other composers would have done, which is found a way to open the show. They say, well, it opens on a misty morning, but we'll have all the townspeople come in and they all sing a chorus first, and then the mist will rise and on will come Curly. That's what others would might have done. But what Oscar did was say, no, okay, let's just start with Curly. Let's start with an empty stage and a woman churning butter and a voice coming off stage, and let's see what happens. And everybody, I'm sure, said, oh, but the, the audience uh, won't feel they're at a musical. Hmm. But they did. And that's the tradition that you picked up from. Absolutely. Because of him. Absolutely. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. The corn is as high as an elephant's eye. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. All the sounds of the earth are like music. All the sounds of the earth are like music. The breeze is so busy, it don't miss a tree. And old weeping willow is laughing at me. Oh, what a beautiful. 
beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. Oh, what a beautiful day. Tell me about your second record. I decided to throw modesty to the winds and take to the islands, some of my own pieces, not just because I enjoy them, but because they bring memories back, good memories, memories of working on the shows. And the first of these is Sweeney Todd, which is probably the show that was easiest for me to write. It just flowed. Gentlemen who never thereafter were heard of again. He trod a path that few have trod. Did Sweeney Todd, a demon barber of Fleet Street. He kept a shop in London town of fancy clients and good renown. And what if none of their souls were saved? They went to their maker impeccably shaved. By Sweeney, by Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. The Ballad of Sweeney Todd, sung by members of the company from the original cast, music and lyrics by my castaway Stephen Sondheim. You often said that uh, it's a great piece of Dickensian melodrama that that, that it's your that it was your love letter to London, a mm. pretty poisoned letter. <laughs> well, no, it's uh, no. I, I've always been an Anglophile uh, from the very f- my first visit was for West Side Story. As a matter of fact, it was the first time I was ever here, and I've always liked Victorian melodrama, and this was you know. A combination of all those things. So it was uh, a love but, letter to 19th century Victorian melodrama in London. <laughs> but in spite of that, the, the critics were pretty savage about it at the time. They've been yes. nice about it since, but at the time it didn't no, last they, they, long. No, they, no they, they, they were pretty awful. I, 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 was, I was hurt. And then a, a, a friend of mine, a playwright, John Guare, had, a, had an, an, an explanation. He said, first of all, it's a British folk tale. And it's their property, and along come some brash Americans who put it on, who, you know. And he said, and then, he said, you took it seriously. Nobody takes Sweeney Todd seriously over there, he said. He said, it's exactly as if the British brought over a serious musical of I Love Lucy. And what would we say in America? We'd say, you can't take I Love Lucy seriously. And do it. This is a, 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 the kind of thing that you scare children to make them go to sleep with. And here is this, you know, two and a half hour brrr, Victorian operetta about this silly folktale. Let's go back to Oscar Hammerstein and this kind of ongoing masterclass that you enjoyed mm. for so long. Very mm. privileged. How did you come to meet him? My parents were divorced when I was 10 years old. and My mother got custody of me and she bought a farm in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And three miles from the house she bought lived the Hammerstein family. They had a son named Jimmy, my age, and we became close chums. And I had had a good deal of difficulty with my mother, who was a difficult woman. And I spent more and more time over at the Hammerstein house and became a kind of surrogate son. 
And Oscar became a surrogate father. I, I like my father a lot, but I didn't see him all that often because my mother had custody and, and she was angry at him. By the time I was 12 or 13 years old, I was in the Hammerstein house much more than I was in my own. So Oscar became a surrogate father for me, and he encouraged me to be a songwriter, although I had, I'd only been moderately interested in, in music before that. I'd taken piano lessons for two years. And but you didn't take to it straight away. It was, it was, it was okay. I, I didn't, I, it was fun, but it wasn't all that much fun. My father used to, uh, was a big Broadway show fan, and um, he was in the dress business, and he often took buyers to, to Broadway shows, and uh, he played piano by ear. So there was always show music around the household before I met Hammerstein. But you were really a movie buff. Ah, yeah, movies were movies were my thing. Yes. Is it true you went on the sixty four thousand dollars? I was. I was. I w- I didn't go. I didn't go on it. I auditioned for it and was accepted. But then they realized that I was at that time. I had my first job. I was writing for television, and they didn't want anybody in show business on the subject of anything in show business. What they liked was nuns who were experts on boxing and things like that. So home life was pretty miserable. Mother. Well, it wasn't because my mother was not around that much. It wasn't happy. It wasn't happy. But, but she I had hot and cold, didn't she? Well, <laughs> mostly, mostly hot. I think, uh, <laughs> particularly when she realized that that I consider the Hammersteins my family and not her. Then she had a terrible conflict because she wanted to maintain her friendship with them because Oscar was a celebrity. At the same time, she was furious. She used to say to me she would sue them for alienation of affection. Now, I didn't know what alienation... She's she's telling this to a 12-year-old boy. And, of course, her idea of alienation of affection is not the court's idea of it. What she was saying to me is, you like them more than I, so I can sue them for alienation of affection. That was her phrase. And did you eventually become totally alienated from her? Uh, No, yes. I eventually realized... She she told me that... um, if I ever saw my father without her permission, she could have him thrown in jail. It was, of course, a lie, but I didn't realize it was a lie till I was 15 years old. And the minute I realized it was a lie, I packed up and went and lived with my father. Did you see her again? Oh, yes. Oh, sure, sure. And I eventually I had to support her. She got married again. And then when she, uh, uh, her husband died and she moved back to Manhattan and I supported her and saw her. So in and the end, she... Filial, filial, filial duty. Mm, not love. No. Record number three. The next piece of music I take to the island is, uh, I guess, maybe my favorite classical piece of music, the Brahms Second Piano Concerto. It's hard to explain why it affects me so much. It affects me profoundly and always has from the first day I ever heard it. Alfred Brendel playing part of the last movement of Brahms' Piano Concerto No. 2 in B-flat with the Berlin Philharmonic, conducted by Claudio Abbado. Weren't you, um, Stephen Sondheim, going to become a concert pianist at one point? Not really. When I was in my teens, I resumed piano lessons, and um, I gave some recitals around Pennsylvania, which is where I went to school. However, uh, one day I was playing, uh, I think, the Chopin Polonaise Fantasy, 
which is a large ABA form. And I got to the end of the A, and I was sort of playing on automatic pilot, and I suddenly woke up and thought, oh, my God, what comes next? Oh, oh, I could not remember anything. So I merely went back to the beginning of the A again, and of course nobody in the audience missed it or knew the difference. I thought, oh, what is the point of all this? So I, I, I played AA with no B in it. <laughs> But the story goes then that you um, you wrote your first musical age fifteen. Mm-hmm. You um, took it in to Oscar. Oh yes, uh, absolutely convinced that it would be on Broadway within the year. Absolutely within the week, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it was it was a, a local. I went to a school called George School, and I wrote a show called By George with two classmates. I brought it to Oscar and asked him to judge it not as if I were a friend of the family, but as if. Uh, it was a script that merely crossed his desk. And so I came over to his house the next day to sign the contract. And uh, <laughs> he said, if you really want me to, to treat this as if it were from a stranger, I must say it's the worst thing I've ever read. And I was, you know, shocked beyond belief. And he said, it's not untalented, but if you'd like to know why it's terrible, I will tell you. And he proceeded to tell me, starting from the first sentence, from the first stage direction. But hugely important afternoon, obviously, and you can't repeat it all now, but I wonder, is there a kind of distillation? Is there you yes. know, a very central trick? That there, he... It's not a trick. No, it's a central principle, which is to treat songs like little one-act plays, where you present a, a situation and then either resolve it or, if you don't resolve it, move it forward so that by the time you've finished the song, you're at a different point than you are where you were. This is in, in terms of the story of the, of the show, of, of, mm. of the play. So that each song has a function. What about the putting together of the music and, and lyrics? That just comes with practice. And, and But I'm just thinking about something as simple as, oh, what a beautiful oh, morning. Oh, I see what you mean, yes. Very straightforward, very simple, but it's how it sits on the music. That's, of, course it, of course it is. If you look at the, if you look at the opening quatrain of Oklahoma and it says, oh, what a, morning, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day. It's not very interesting because it's so simple. It's when it sits on the music that that it blossoms, that it gains size and stature and uh, uh, delight. But you went on to write the lyrics, as I said in the introduction to West Side Story, and you wrote, um, I've just met a girl called Maria and I want to be in America. You've said since that you were a bit embarrassed by those lyrics or you don't like Oh, yeah, some, some, you know, some of them because Lenny was very... Anxious that the show be important, Leonard and Bernstein. yes, Leonard Bernstein was. Uh, he wanted the show to be important, and therefore he thought the lyrics should be poetic. Well, his idea of poetry is my idea of purple prose. I mean, we just don't agree. So, he would urge me, and I was only twenty-five years old, and you know, I was the mascot of the group, so to speak. And though I uh, had my own principles and opinions, I was trying to please everybody. So, in trying to please Lenny, I pushed myself to write some fairly purple passages, you know, today the world was just an address, is not, I think, what a street boy who's an ex-gang member would say. And I feel pretty, of course, is my bete noir, you know, that you know, the idea that Maria would sing a song of such elegant phrasing is, is, is deeply embarrassing. No, the, the, the lyrics I like in that show are few and far between, but uh, uh, Something's Coming is a lyric I like, because that sounds like a boy being excited, and the Jet song I like. Could be Who knows that Something do any day I will know right away Soon as it shows It make them cannonballing down through the sky Gleam in its eye Bright as a rose Who knows It's only just out of reach Down the block on a beach Under a tree I got a feeling there's a miracle do Gonna come true Coming to me Could it be? Yes, it could. Something's coming, something good. If I can wait, something's coming. I don't know what it is, but it is gonna be great. With a click, with a shock, phone will jingle, door will knock. Open the latch, something's coming. Don't know when, but it's soon. Catch the moon, one-handed catch. 
it will maybe just by holding still it'll be there come on something come on in don't be shy meet a guy pull up a chair the air is humming and something great is coming Just out of reach, down the block on a beach, maybe tonight. What's your next one? This is Sunday in the Park with George, a show I wrote with James Lapine. This is the first time I ever worked off Broadway and didn't have the pressures of Broadway production. Just to write a show for the purpose of putting on a show was enormous pleasure for me. And I also like the score, and I'm particularly proud of a song called Finishing the Hat, which is a uh, pian to the artistic process. Finishing the hat. How you have to finish the hat. How you watch the rest of the world from a window. While you finish the hat, mapping out a sky, what you feel like planning the sky, what you feel when voices that come through the window go until they distance and die, until there's nothing but sky, and how you're always turning back too late from the grass or the stick or the dog or the light, how the kind of that you want to find waiting to return you to the night dizzy from the height coming from the hat studying the hat entering the world of the hat reaching through the world of the hat like a window back to this one from that studying a face Stepping back to look at the face Leaves a little space in the way Like a window But to see It's the only way to see And when the woman that you want it goes You can say to yourself Well, I give what I give But the woman who won't wait for you now Always standing by, mapping out the sky, finishing a hat. Mandy Patinkin as George singing Finishing the Hat in Stephen Sondheim's musical Sunday in the Park with George. So you um, followed up the lyrics to West Side Story with the lyrics to Gypsy, which was a huge hit. You weren't even 30 years old, I don't think. It it was not a huge hit. Like West Side Story, it was a very moderate hit. It ran less than two years, which is not... I think it made its money back, but it's not a big hit. But you made a lot of money. You bought a big place in Manhattan with a garden. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, ah, no, I got a bank loan, yes. I got a (laughs) bank loan as a result of the sale of Gypsy to the movies. But you moved in next door to Catherine Hepburn. I did indeed. Uh, You must have felt very proud of yourself, really. As I say, hardly 30. There you were, all set up. But interestingly, what you then decided to do was, right, I've I've had enough of just writing lyrics. I'm going to get to grips with the music as well. So that makes you very ambitious, perhaps arrogant too? No, first of all, I'd started that, uh, the funny thing I'm away the forum, which was, in fact, the show that came next. I'd started earlier. Gypsy was an interruption. Immediately after West Side Story, I thought, all right, enough of just writing lyrics, because I was, I was trained as a composer, and that's what I wanted to do. 
and I went to my friend Bert Shevelov, who uh, suggested that we do a musical based on Plautus's plays. And we all started work on a funny thing happened with the forum. Quite now, a recherche source, though. Well, he, but Bert, Bert, Bert saw a possibility in it because they're really funny situation. And in fact, Plautus invented situation comedy, as we know it all. It was domestic comedy, you know, cuckolded husbands and things like that. And um, Bert said, and we could make a, a musical farce. And so that's, in fact, what we did. You know, Huge hit. Yes, that was my first big hit. Zero Mostel starred in, in mm-hmm. New York. Frankie Howard here, of course. That's correct. It was very much mm-hmm. the making of that certain part of Frankie Howard. Um, does it remain your biggest hit? Sure. Yes. I think I, it does. I, th- I think, um, yes, it's certainly the biggest, the biggest hit uh, on Broadway. It ran, I think, just under 1,000 performances. It, it supported me for many, 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 many years, essentially, the income from various productions all over the world, and particularly from schools, universities, although there have been schools in the United States that have refused to do it because it uses the word virgin. Something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Something appealing, something appalling, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Nothing for kings, nothing for crowns. Bring on the lovers, liars, and clowns. Oh, situations, new complications. Nothing portentous or polite. Tragedy tomorrow, comedy tonight. Something convulsive, something repulsive, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Something aesthetic, something frenetic, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Nothing of dust, nothing of fate. Weighty affairs will just have to wait. Something that's gaudy, something that's gaudy. and eunuchs, funerals and chases, baritones and basses, panderers, philanderers, cupidity, timidity, mistakes, fakes, rhymes, rhymes, tumblers, rumblers, 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 no royal curse, no Trojan horse, and there's a happy ending, of course, goodness and badness, man in his madness, this time it all turns out all right. Number five. I'm, I'm very fond of piano concertos as a form, as you can tell from the Brahms, but my other favorite piano concerto is quite a different one. It's the Ravel Left Hand Piano Concerto. One of the reasons I would take it to the island is not only that I love it, but it's also the subject of my senior thesis in college. So it's something I spent a lot of time on and got to love uh, as much as maybe Ravel loved it himself.
part of Ravel's piano concerto in D major for the left hand. As far as performance of your work is concerned, Stephen, you prefer, I think, in the main, actors to singers. Can you? Yeah, I. Uh, it's not preferring actors to singers, but uh, if if I'm if I have to decide between an actor who sings all right and a singer who acts all right. I think I prefer the actor who sings right for most of the shows. That's not true of all of them. But does all of that indicate that, that you are... I mean, again, I'm asking you to define yourself, and I know you don't like doing it, but, but, but are you as much a playwright as you are a songwriter, a, a writer of musical theatre? Does your theatre happen to be musical? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I consider myself a playwright who writes in song. I'm, I get attracted to stories. I do not get attracted to themes... Or theses. There uh, are themes and theses. Yes, but there? but they 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 are never in the forefront of my head, and I never think of anything except telling the story, creating suspense, making laughs, and and dealing with character, because playwrights are essentially actors. And mm. when I write a song, I'm really an actor. And but and it's also that's what being created really by you, and it's born of you. And of course, you know what people would say about your themes are that there are, and you've talked about, you know, the, the miserableness of your parents' divorce and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. There is divorce. There are kind of strange Maybe. breakups. There are relationships mm -hmm. that can't last. And that's don't true last. of virtually every play. Ninety percent of the plays ever written by anybody deal with relationships. They deal with things like revenge, with anger, with all these things that you can say, oh, yes, you see, that's traceable back to uh, the, the breakup of the home. So many players deal with breakups of homes, including King Lear. I mean, you know. Uh, so these are... <laughs> these are OK. Quote, what about tone, though? Because, again, uh, uh, you have been defined by people who studied your work very closely as having a, a cynical tone, slightly sour. I think Leonard Bernstein said you were slightly but, sour. Well, Leonard Bernstein yeah. was not the founder of wisdom. That's, his, that's cynicism, his opinion. There's cynicism there, isn't there? I mean, it's what, make, what makes it more interesting, isn't it? It's, it, you know, I mean, let, let, me quote you, let me quote you to yourself, you know, the, the song The Little Things You Do Together from Company. The concerts you enjoy together, neighbours you annoy together, children children you destroy together. That, that show is not a cynical show, but it, uh, but it has a raised eyebrow about the accepted aspects of certain, quote, relationships. I think one of the reasons I'm considered a, a so-called cynical writer is the company is the show, I hate the word breakthrough, but the show that it's the first time I ever got good reviews. It's as simple as that. And therefore, people associate me with urban, what you'd call cynicism. Uh, and then the next show I did was Follies, which deals with the difficulty of two long-running marriages. So everybody said, ah, you see what he is, he's cynical about marriage, etc. Then nobody could quite pin it down when it came to A Little Night Music, because A Little Night Music is a romantic piece in which everybody gets their heart's desire at the end. So it was very difficult to suddenly say, oh, you see, it was uh, it's cynical. Then came Pacific Overtures. And nobody could fit that into that category at all because it's not about marriage. It's not about dysfunction. It's about, ah, but you see, it's about the clash of two cultures and how they don't get along together. So you see, everything is reducible. It's the little things you do together, do together, do together that make perfect relationships. Hobbies you pursue together, savings you accrue together, looks you misconstrue together that make marriage a joy. It's the little things you share together, swear together, wear together, that make perfect relationships. Concerts you enjoy together, neighbors you annoy together, children you destroy together, that keep marriage intact. It's not so hard to be married when two maneuver as one. It's not so hard to be married, and Jesus Christ is it fun. It's sharing little winks together, drinks together, kinks together, that make marriage a joy. It's bargains that you shop together, cigarettes you stop together, clothing that you swap together, that make perfect relationships. It's not talk of God and the decade ahead that allows you to get through the worst. It's I do and you don't and nobody said that. And who brought the subject up first? It's the little things. The little things, the little things, the little things. It's the little ways you try together, cry together, lie together. That makes perfect relationships. Becoming a cliche together. Growing old and gray together. Withering away together. Joy. 
It's not so hard to be merry. It's much the cleanest of crime. It's not so hard to be merry. I've done it three or four times. It's people that you hate together, mate together, date together, that make marriage a joy. It's things like using force together, shouting till you're horse together, getting a divorce together, that, that make perfect relationships. Next piece of music. The next piece of music was the subject of my junior thesis at college, but this one I would take for sheer pleasure, and it's the Aaron Copeland Music for the Theater. It's wonderfully orchestrated, and for sheer listening pleasure, I would take it to the island. Part of the interlude from Copeland's Music for the Theatre, played by the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Joel Levy. When when is the moment, Stephen, in all of the whole cycle of production, writing and production, staging and so on, that that you feel the greatest joy? That you go, yes. Oh, I, I think it's the universal one. I think you'd find the same answer from virtually everybody. First, there's the the, the joy for the composer when you hear the orchestra reading down the score and you hear the instruments for the first time. Then the look on the faces of the cast when they hear the orchestra for the first time is, you know, it's like the look on the face of children on birthdays and, and Christmas. It is it is unalloyed joy, and whatever the problems of the show, they disappear for that day. Do you think, uh, I mean, because you've been very honest about it, how can you be otherwise? You, you've had your share of flops, as it were. Do you, th- <laughs> do you think, you're always philosophical about it now, but do you think the audience takes... A, some time to catch up with you. I, I because think, when they're put on again, yes. when they're revived, they often really work and everybody yeah. clamors. I, yes, I, I think, again, at, at the risk of immodesty, the stuff I write deserves a second or third hearing for people sometimes because sometimes the approach is so peculiar. But I'm attracted to experimental theatre. You know, I was my, apprentice, my apprenticeship in the professional theatre was on um, Roger and Hammerstein's third show, which is called Allegro. The critics disliked Allegro intensely because it was such a peculiar way to tell a story. The Our Town Chinese theater approach telling a story, and it tells 40 years of a man's life. It doesn't have a plot. So that I've always been attracted, perhaps, to a kind of theater that comes in from left field. Hmm. Uh, And shows like Assassin, Sunday in the Park with George, you wouldn't expect them to be hits because the approach is not traditional musical theater. An audience has to be alert, and it's not comfortable for them. Audiences are comfortable with what they've seen before. So if, before if, be if people were to suggest, therefore, that Andrew Lloyd Webber and his long-running shows on Broadway and, 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 and in the West End here was more Oscars' rightful heir than you, would you challenge that? 
you're using Lloyd Webber, but there are many, many, many shows that are in a kind of direct storytelling line that do not experiment. I like to do it, and I like to see it when I go as a member of the audience, isn't mm. just as a writer. But if we're talking about musical theatre, you know, I mentioned Lloyd Webber because he's the name that comes up. Of course, he's got mm. long-running shows. Mm-hmm. They go on for years, well, both here and there, you mm-hmm. know. It's, uh, no, you, you feel I, no envy. You feel it's no. Not, it's not. It's It's a different. It's a different. It's a different animal. It's. Uh, I've written traditional shows. Uh, Sweeney Todd is traditional. It's not traditional in subject matter, but it's traditional in storytelling matter in, in the way it tells a story. So sometimes I, I write traditional, what you'd call the Oscar Hammerstein tradition. I'm. Uh, I, uh, uh, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I've seen them all in my dear I'm still here Where I fell but sometimes Sometimes just pretzels and beer But I'm here I've stuffed the dailies in my shoes Strummed ukuleles, sung the blues Seen all my dreams disappear But I'm here I've slept in shanties Guests off the WPA But I'm here I danced in my scanties Three bucks a night was the pay But I'm here I've stood on bread lines With the best Watched while the headlines did the rest In the depression was I depressed Nowhere near I met a big financier And I'm here I've gotten through her
Number seven. Another one of yours. Yeah. The other show I would take of my own to the island is Pacific Overtures. And I think part of the reason is I just saw a production of it in Tokyo last month at the National Theatre there, which was stunningly exciting. And this is the opening number. Advantages of Floating in the Middle of the Sea, sung by the company from the original Broadway cast recording of Stephen Sondheim's Pacific Overtures. You um, have a reputation for being a bit of a pessimist, Stephen, so uh, that's not going to stand you in good stead on this island, is it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Actually, you haven't seemed like a pessimist today. No, I don't, I don't think of myself as a pessimist. Um, I tend I tend to be slightly doer, there's no question, but I don't think of myself as a pessimist. So you're not going to kind of sink and fall on the sand in a heap? No, I'll, I'm, I'm certainly, I'll certainly feel helpless. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm used to running water and... Uh, you're an urban and, animal. Oh, absolutely. I was born in Manhattan, brought up in Manhattan, and um, though I have lived in the country and I love the country, my roots are urban, absolutely. And but, that means all the conveniences of urban living. So you you wouldn't be any good with the sort of you know the pen knife sharpening the no, stick and I'd be, uh, spearing I would, the rabbit. If somebody told me to do it and how to do it, then I'd be very good. I'm very good at following instructions. You know, if you say or if somebody said collect the firewood but and do this. There's nobody to tell you that. No, and then in that case, no. Yeah. In that case, what? In that case, I, no, I'm, I'm I'd be helpless. Would you? Isn't yeah. there a steeliness inside there that would uh, get well, you Well, yeah, about survive, I don't really know. If uh, there's, to answer you very seriously, I have no idea what my Survivor quotion is, I really don't know. You might have to find out. Mm. Last piece of music. I, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the great pieces of the 20th century is the Symphony of Psalms by Stravinsky. And not only the whole piece, but the Alleluia is a chord progression I'm so jealous of. I wish I'd thought of it. And I used to stand on street corners in my college days with a girl I knew and a married couple, a guy who went to college and his wife, and we would stand on street corners and sing just <laughs> the little chord progression of Alleluia, which is in four-part harmony. It's the only time I've ever indulged in such, uh, such silliness, but the whole piece is, is wonderful.
the English Bach Festival Choir singing part of the last movement of Stravinsky's Symphony of Psalms with the London Symphony Orchestra conducted by Leonard Bernstein. OK, there's your eight records. If you could only take one of those eight, which one would you take? I guess it would be Porgy. What about your book? We give you the Bible and we give you the complete works of Shakespeare. Uh, I'm not much of a reader, but a, a man I think I could live with in et- for eternity is E.B. White. He has a way of dealing with the English language that seems so simple and is always so moving. And what about your luxury? Something non-practical? It would have to be a piano because I get such pleasure out of playing the piano. In thinking about the luxury, I thought, well, is there is there electricity on the island? Because then maybe a VCR and a lot of old movies would be <laughs> terrific. But I think uh, for, uh, for eternity or for a long stay, it would have to be a piano. Stephen Sondheim, thank you very much indeed for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you.